in this okay. book. My okay. primary reason... Could you restart, please, because we're not recording. Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> Can you please? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, and more students are coming, so. Should I wait? That's fine. Okay. Please go and sit at the front, sisters, so it's easier for others to, to join. Sit at the front, thank you. Please. So my, my primary reason for writing this work was my thought that although there is a huge amount of devotion to, to, to Lady Zainab in the Islamic world, and specifically the Shi'i world, most of the devotion is based on very few texts, that there may be a great deal of what we could call hagiography, writings about her, her life, her holiness, but, but academic texts about her, a real academic biography, didn't seem to me to exist. And that was the thing that, that pushed me the hardest. I thought she deserves her own biography, not just a pamphlet, but something deeper. Furthermore, and I said this last summer, I thought that perhaps the reinterpretation of Zainab during the time of the Iranian Revolution was not necessarily a good reinterpretation. Um, Shariati reinterpreted the figure of Lady Fatima and turned her into a, a very particular revolutionary figure, heroic figure, in a way that suited the narrative of Iran in the 1970s. And I think Zainab also, in many ways, was reinterpreted and she became sometimes a rather emotionless heroine, absolutely fearless in moments of of battle, absolutely fearless about the future, that, that may have been useful in a particular socio-political context, but I wasn't sure if that didn't take Zainab out of the grasp of ordinary people who, who needed a model. And so I aimed at what I called a Zenabian, and that, does, that word doesn't exist, I invented that word, a Zenabian theology or a Zenabian praxis. That is, I, I was trying to represent the life of Zainab in a manner that perhaps put her back into the reach of ordinary people who may not be engaged in socio-political struggles and great revolutionary moments, but who have to live daily life and make daily choices that are sometimes very difficult, especially moral choices, and who need a model, who need somebody, a man or a woman, who they can hold on to. My, my own training is primarily as an historian, and most of my research is historical research within the confines of Shi Islam, and especially historical research around Karbala and the people who, who, who populate that battle. With the understanding that I always use, use the Sunni and the Shi'i text, because I think both need to be read together, and I'm interested to know what the Sunni authors are saying about Zainab and about Karbala. But I also know there's a difference between reading an historical text such as Tabari or Baladuri or, or Yaqubi, some of, or if he, or Mas'udi, the, the so-called Shia historians. There's a difference between reading them and reading Hadith. Hadith is a different type of literature. Hadith is sacred history. It's, it's outside of the bounds of history. And I've taken that into account in, in using those texts. But there's something more important for me, and that is that that when Christians like myself read the Holy Quran, we read it the way we read the Bible. And we expect that the Quran is going to read in the same way that the Bible reads, and of course it doesn't. Then we lose patience and say, what is this? We don't understand this. The same applies to the holy people of the Ahl Bayt. Christians look at them in a Christian way. We Christianize people like Fatima and Zainab. We make them into what appear to be Christian-like saints. So we say, you know, Zainab is very much like Mary, when in fact she's not. Zainab is Zainab. She is her own personality. So what I've tried to avoid doing is reading the life of Zainab as a Christian, or in a Christian way. I want her to be holy as a Muslim woman, not as a, a half-Christian, half-Muslim. And I've, I, I've tried to do that in the course of writing this book. So as a second context then, um, I, I think, and I was challenged by um, one, one author, not a Muslim, but a Christian, I think that at the core of Zainab's life, there are two journeys. There is an historical journey, 
That is the journey that she takes from Medina to Karbala, then from Karbala to Kufa, then from Kufa to Damascus, and then from Damascus back to Medina and maybe, maybe to Egypt, we're not so sure, wherever she ended her life. That is the historical journey. But I think there's a second journey, and I think it's the existential journey. Now, when Shariati wrote on Lady Fatima, his book was called Fatima is Fatima. And he was describing the transformation of the Lady Fatima into the person that God created her to be. That's an existential journey. And when this critic said, Shia Muslims don't believe in existentialism, I said, well, let's look at Shariati's work and see if that's true. I think that the second of the journeys of Zainab is an existential journey. That at the heart it is Zainab becoming the woman she was created to be and taking on a specific role which lasted for a short time, really. The, the, the heart of her role is over a few days, but she's at her most powerful in those days. And, and it's within that journey that I think Zainab, the model, exists, not just for Muslims or Shia Muslims, not just for women, but for any human being who needs a model. It's in that existential journey where Zainab becomes what God created her to be. So, the account or the fragments of account, as I said last summer, I used Tabari, who is of course a Sunni historian, but his, his chronology of the Battle of Karbala is not bad. He's missing some things, and I also think he gets some things wrong. But nonetheless, as an outline, I've used him to plot this graph or this life of Zainab, or the Zanabian, what I call the Zanabian, journey. And the, the, the Zenabian journey, as I've tried to introduce it in this book, has about 11 key moments. That is, just before and during and then after the Battle of Karbala. And I'm going to run through those quickly because that's how I wanted to, to discuss this book. The first, it takes place at a, at a, at a place called Khuzamiya. Now, the thing is that Tab Tabari doesn't mention this. But most of the other texts do, and I regard it as a crucial insight into what was going on mentally at that moment for Lady Zainab. It's this vision that takes place, Huzamir is about halfway, almost halfway between Mecca and Karbala. And it's a long journey from Mecca to Karbala, it's not just an hour or two. And about halfway, there were a number of places that Hussein and his group stopped, and Khuzamiya was one of these places. And this, for me, marks the first significant moment in the story of Al Hussein's sister in those pre karbala days. It's not in Tabari, but it's in Khawarizmi's Maktal. Now, Khawarizmi is a Sunni. He is a Hanafi, or Hanafi scholar. He was the, the, the pupil of Zamakhshari. So you're dealing with a Sunni who has a great love for the Ahl Bayt and great sympathy. And I've, I've used it because it's in his Maktal and a few other, Ibn Shahra Shub, also in his work. But it gives us an idea of what was going on in her mind. It is a lament that Lady Zainab hears on the night air by a voice or voices that she cannot or that are not identified. Now, right through the Shi texts, there are many occasions when the jinn are heard to lament the death of Hussein. Um Salama hears them, for example, but other people hear them as well. So it's a popular theme, the idea of hearing voices that you can't identify on the night air. But this, this was a voice heard by Zainab, and it's lamenting the killing of Al Hussein before it's happened. And, and um, I put into the book the, the, the text, the, the lament says, oh, I, so, so the, the man or the, the voice is talking to his own eyes, be extravagant in your weeping. Because who will weep over the martyrs after me? Who will weep over this people who are being conveyed to death and they're achieving, they're achieving a promise that was made, what they're doing. So it's a description of the martyrdom, but it's an invitation to weep. Zainab doesn't know who the voice is, and she doesn't know what the verse means. And she goes to her brother, who gives her a very simple answer to it, but it doesn't satisfy her. And so the Zainab at Khuzamiya is a very distraught woman by the time that she's heard this verse. The second incident follows on quite soon, and it's in Tabari. And Tabari is narrating from Abu Mikhnaf, and Abu Mikhnaf has the earliest, perhaps, account 
of, of the battle that we have. And so a great deal of Tabari's reports come from Mihnaf via a number of transmitters. This is probably takes place after the Asr prayer, Thursday the 9th of Muharram. I am going on the chronology that, and Tabari I think is wrong, that, that Ashura was on Friday. Not on Saturday. Some of the Shia takes say Saturday, but it wasn't Saturday. Ashura was Friday. And this is the day before. It is the afternoon, sometime after the prayer. And Zainab hears the noise of this army coming, the enemy army. And she is frightened again. And she goes to her, her brother. And her brother is sitting in front of his tent preparing, they say, his sword for battle. In fact, he's fast asleep dreaming of his grandfather. And in that moment, Hussein is having a vision of the Prophet Muhammad, who, and sometimes not Muhammad alone, but also other members of the Ahl Bayt, who are saying, you're coming to us very soon. Maybe tomorrow, some of the texts say. Um, Zainab is, is hysterical when she hears this. She breaks down in front of her brother. She says, woe is me. And he replies, woe is not for you, my sister. But but it's important for me because it's giving us a mental picture of Zainab before the battle. So the first two incidents upset her terribly. The third incident is the night before Hussein's death. And again, this is um, carried, it's a lament carried by a number of transmitters. And it's, it's, it's Hussein's lament as he sits in front of his tent. And Zainab, who is busy nursing her nephew, Zain al-Abdin, who is already sick at this moment and has to be nursed, the two of them together hear the lament of, of Hussein. Ya dahar uf laka. What a, what a, how useless you are as a friend. Time. Kam laka bil ishraq wal asil. Um, how, how many people, by the time of late sunrise or late afternoon, how many people, companions or seekers, mean sahib wa talib qatil will be dead because of you. But time, he says, will not be content with anything else but this martyrdom that's coming. Wa innam al-amru illa al-jalil. The matter is with the majestic one. And every living creature is a traveler on the path. This poem greatly disturbs Lady Zainab. Um, Zainal Abedin says, I memorized it, I heard it, and I, he kept repeating it, and I memorized it, and I was choked with tears because I knew something bad was happening. But Lady Zainab breaks down. And while Ali, Ali bin al Hussein is choked with tears, he says, As for my aunt, she heard what I heard, but she's a woman, and weakness and grief are the qualities of a woman. Zainab leaps to her feet, goes to her brother, uh, who consoles her. But judging by her words, I suspect, and this is my own private theory, that this was the moment Zainab realized what Karbala was. That this was the moment she understood that she'd heard the predictions of her brother's death already. She knew them, but I'm not convinced she knew that this was the moment. And it was when she heard this poem, she said, will I lose my brother also? I've lost my mother, I've lost my father, I've lost my uncle, um, my, my other brother, Hassan. Will I lose this brother too? I suspect that this is the moment. Now, people can, can differ, but this is my own reading of her life. Now, um, the next incident is the next day. So we don't hear anything more about Zainab for this night. And the next day, battle begins. And the first incident is the death of the, the son, or a son, we will talk about this now, of al Hussein. Now, one of the th things I discovered with the Shi'i texts is that none of them agree about how many sons Hussein had, and which was Al-Akbar, and which was Al-Sahir, and which was the middle one, al Awsat. So there's a big discrepancy. So if you read uh, Al-Irshad, if you read you know, Sheikh Mufid, he says one thing, all of the authors give various lists of sons, and I had to just finally make a choice. And I made the choice that I think most people go with. And that is that, that um, so, so sorry, so this marks, let me just talk about this first. This marks the, the first emergence of Zainab onto the battlefield. Now, up until now, we've had three incidents in which Zainab has been absolutely distraught. But now, now the texts say she looked like the sun rising. 
as she walked onto the battlefield. So for me, this is part of the existential journey. There has been, during this night of Thursday, some sort of transformation in Zainab's life because the woman who emerges onto the battlefield for the first time when her nephew is killed is not the same woman who was hysterical the night before when she heard the dirge of her brother. And the Sunni texts contain the phrase, she looked like the rising sun. From an eyewitness who we will keep coming across, we will mention him just now. And I'm convinced that, that the use of sun and moon in Islamic texts means more than just her face was bright. Often the Prophet himself is described as having a face like the moon or the first portion of the moon. There is a mystical meaning to this. It's not just because the, the writer can't think what else to say. And we will come across another boy just now who also has a face that looks like the moon. Zainab is at this moment becoming Zainab, moving from distress to the fourth incident in which she is the sun rising. And I think that this is part of Ali's daughter's transformation on the field of Karbala. So, so just to move on quickly, the sons of Hussein. Hussein had at least six sons. As far as I know, they were all called Ali. And, uh, um, and, and um, they were all called Ali because, because in defiance of the rulers who wouldn't allow the name of Ali to be used. So all of the sons are Ali, and we have to try and figure out which is which. And this is, my, this is my, what I go with, and I think most people go with that. The first is Ali al-Akbar, the eldest, killed at Karbala, and he must have been about 28 on the day of his death. He couldn't have been younger. But some of the Shia texts don't call him Ali al-Akbar, and some of the Shia texts make him much younger. I don't think he was younger. I think he was 28, born around 33. The second son is Ali al-Awsat. That's Zain al Abidin. He's the middle Ali, because there's a younger one still coming up. Born around 38, so he must have been 22, 23, around the time of Karbala. And that's what makes some of the texts interesting when when the Umayyad leaders say, is he a man? They're mocking him. Of course he's a man. It's quite obvious that 23 is a man. They're making a mockery of the Imam. And then the fourth son is Abdullah, known as Ali al Asra. He is the one who's killed in his father's arms or on his father's lap at the Battle of Karbala. So, so the son we're talking about, and these are all, of course, nephews of Lady Zainab. The first one that she reacts to is Ali al-Akbar, and it's a dramatic scene. She comes out and she throws herself over, over his body after he is killed. The curious thing is, she's not going to react at the death of every nephew. Just some of the nephews, and it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a, a puzzle. The, the next incident is really the most moving, I think, because of the whole battle. This little boy, we're told that he's a young boy, his face is like the first splinter of the moon, says the text. But more important, one of his sandal straps is broken. Now, when an eyewitnesses notice something like that, when an eyewitness picks up a tiny detail, his sandal strap was broken as he walked onto the battlefield, dragging the saw that he could hardly pick up. The eyewitness is a man called Humayd bin Muslim al-Azdi. He will come again, again and again in the texts. And he will intervene at the end of the battle and save the life of Zain al-Abidin from at the end of the battle. Zainab is not recorded as reacting to this death. The reason I include it is because, well, for two reasons. Because the, the boy's face is described as being like the moon. So this is the second person who is described as having some form of almost mystical transformation that gives him the courage, this little boy, to walk onto the battlefield even though he's so small. And the second thing is that who made the eyewitness who's going to keep recurring is trustworthy because he notices little things. And when eyewitnesses see tiny things, you know they've seen a great deal. So we will, we will, we will, I put this in not because Zainab's involved, but because there is a transformation that takes place and Humayd notices this transformation. The next um, incident is the killing of Abdullah al husbin al Hussein. This is the little baby. Um, no, this is not the baby, sorry. This is another nephew who, um, who, who emerges onto the battlefield and um, I think I probably made a mistake. I don't think it was Al-Hussein. I think he's Al-Hassan. 
Abdullah bin al-Hassan, not al-Hussein. He emerges onto the battlefield. Um, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. This is the little boy who was killed, Abdullah bin al-Hussein, on his father's lap. The trouble is that most of the accounts don't have Zainab involved in this. There are a few texts, Shi texts, in which, in which he hands his son to Zainab. And, or when she takes the son, but most of the texts, she's not involved in this. It's just important because this, this is now the, the baby son being killed, and the only son left alive is al Awsat, the middle son, who is Zain al-Abidin. <coughs> I include it because, again, there are some texts that record something of Zainab's involvement. The, the seventh incident, then, is the killing of Abdullah bin al-Hassan. This is one of Al-Hassan's sons, and it marks the second emergence of Zainab onto the battlefield. So it's the second nephew that she is trying to save, and, and she's trying to save him because Hussein tells her to. He leaves the tent to go and fight with his uncle, and Hussein says to Zainab, take him back, and she tries to catch him, and the boy will not be caught. And he is determined, he said, I will not be separated from my uncle. So there we have his identity revealed. He's one of Hassan's sons. He takes a stand next to his uncle and he's killed within minutes. But he is always remembered because as he dies, he insults his killer with one of the worst insults. He calls her Habitha, son of a terrible woman. I'm sure it could be translated worse than that, but I'm not going to do that. It's a terrible insult against the man killing him and the mother of the man killing him. And this little boy, as he's about to die, defending his uncle, he, he shouts out this, this insult against the man killing him. And that's what he's always going to be remembered for, this courageous moment in battle. But he's killed almost immediately. The third and final... I'm all right for time, yeah? The third and final emergence of Zainab onto the battlefield is the moment that Hussein himself is going to be killed. Um, there are some biographers that record her lamenting the death of her half-brother Al-Abbas. Oh my brother, we have lost everything when we've lost you. But you will find this in very few of the classical texts. This is in some of the hagi hagiographical works, but very few of the classical texts. In fact, in fact he's a mysterious figure. Um, Al-Abbas in, uh, uh, in many ways, and, and we don't find her lamenting him in the classical texts. So really, she intervenes as her brother is about to be killed, and she challenges, firstly, this dreadful Umar, who had been the battle commander until the powers that be grew impatient with him and replaced him with an equally dreadful man, maybe an even more dreadful man, who we come across. But she goes right up to Umar and appeals, will you just stand there while, while Hussein is being killed? And we are told in the text that he turns away weeping, that he has a moment of great horror at what's happening. But we're also told that the soldiers have to be ordered to kill Hussein. They don't want to. They're all holding back and they're all hoping that somebody else is going to do it. And she challenges them and says, is there not a Muslim among you to the soldiers? But, but, but there is no response. And... Hussein is killed. The aftermath of, of Karbala, the, the, the moments after the battle ended, are moments of great confusion. Um, and the chronology is not always clear, so I've tried to sort it out. So according to Tabari, on the same day, Ashura, 10th of Muharram, the head of Al Hussein and the heads of his companions are dispatched with, with Khawali and Humaid, the eyewitness, is another one, to Ibn Ziyad. On the, the next day, the 11th of Muharram, the bodies of Al-Hussein and his companions are buried at Karbala. And on the 12th of Muharram, the Sunday, the, the women uh, unveiled and put onto camels, and the surviving children, Zain al abidin but there were others as well, they are dispatched to Kufa. But somewhere in those three days, other things happened. The looting of the women in their tents, immediately after the battle, almost certainly. And Umar, this dreadful man who wouldn't save Hussein, comes and intervenes and stops the soldiers from looting the tents of the woman. That's the first intervention. Then there's the attempt to kill Ali bin al Hussein, Zain al Abidin, and Humaid, the eyewitness, intervenes and says, Surely you're not going to kill a child. And, and his life is saved. And then 
the lament of Zainab, after which I named the book Half of My Heart. Tabari says that happened on the 12th, that lament. He's wrong. It couldn't have. Because she laments as she sees the bodies of her brother and his companions. It could only have happened on the 10th. At the moment the women are driven from the tents, Zainab sees the body of her brother and she sings this lament which is not in any of the classical texts, but it is in Bihar al -Anwar. And because it's so beautiful, I felt I have to include this, in which she addresses her brother, if I had known half of my heart, she calls him, that this was predestined, that this was written. It's one of the most powerful laments which I've included in the book. And then, I'm, I'm almost done, there it is. As they're leaving, Muhammad, Muhammad comes this lament, may the angels of heaven bless you. Here is Hussein in the open, stained with blood. Well, this is a famous lament. And this is the lament that could only have taken place on the 10th of Muharram, straight after the battle, when she sees the body of her brother. They arrive at Kufa. And, and last year we did quite a lot of this, so I'm not going to do too much. But, of course, there is the Hdija. Yeah, so. Do I? Yeah. Okay. There is the... There is the Ihtijaj. So people talk about the sermon of Zainab. It wasn't a khutbah. It was a protest. Uh, an Ihtijaj is, is, is what it's called. And her first protest is upon their arrival at Kufa, where she, she finds herself surrounded by the bystanders who have come to see these women and these surviving children, the prisoners who have been brought back. Kufa is the antithesis of Zainab. Kufa remains silent in the face of tyranny. Zainab speaks in the face of tyranny. So, the, so you have these two, two things that are poles apart suddenly meeting as Zainab arrives there. And this, this Zainab is a Zainab who is her at her most powerful now. She is really the matriarch. She is the mother who has gathered all the survivors and she takes for a few days, she takes the leading role because Zain al Abedin cannot take the leading role at that moment. Um, so so she, she has this protest which I've put into the book. It's, it's quite difficult Arabic and I kind of struggle a bit with putting it into English because you know, to put it into English, it has to make sense. And she uses phrases that are, you know, long, white-necked to describe people who have been decapitated. But in English, it doesn't sound good. So it, I try to translate it, and maybe people who have better Arabic can do a better job, uh, just to give a sense. But it's a powerful speech. She attacks the people of Kufa. You're useless, she says. You remain silent. Look what you've allowed to happen. And, and you are going to be judged on this. It's a, it's a really, but it's not as powerful as what she's going to say later when she gets to Damascus. Then she has this um, encounter with the dreadful governor of Kufa. She enters wearing disguised clothing, shabby clothing, um, and sits among her maids. Ibn Ziyad, who I think was mentally unstable. I think that, I think that Yazid maybe not. But Ziyad, something terribly wrong with this man because he changes from anger to praise in a matter of seconds. There's quite clearly something unstable about him. Ziyad demands three times to know who this woman is. Who is the seating one? This sitting woman who has sat down without my permission. And it is a maidservant who answers him and reminds him that this is Zainab, daughter of Fatima, not daughter of Ali. He is, she is reminding Ziyad that this is the daughter of the Prophet. <coughs> and it's quite clear that already Lady Fatima has quite a powerful position in people's minds that her, her very name could be mentioned in such a way. Then there's this dialogue which we did last summer between Zainab and Ziyad, um, in which he begins, Alhamdulillah, praise be to God, who has exposed your lies and exposed the Ahl Bayt. And she replies, praise be to God who has given us the Prophet and who has blessed us. She quotes Quran. And, and he gets furious with her that she dares to answer him. And he has to be calmed down by one of his policemen because the texts say that he begins to have thoughts about her, that he's going to kill her. And he is calmed down in a, in a dreadful way because the, the, the policeman says she's just a woman. Women talk nonsense. Don't, don't even listen to her. Don't let it bother you. But he has to say it in order to calm down this very violent governor. And he saves, in a way, he saves the life 
of, of Zainab at that moment. And then there is this interrogation of Ali. So it is of interest to me that Ibn Ziyad begins with Zainab and he moves to Ali. Yazid goes the other way, he begins with Ali and then he moves on to Zainab. So there's, there are cross purposes. And, and Zainab saves the life of Ali at this moment. Physically, she leaps on top of him. And verbally, she challenges Ziyad. So his life has been saved once already by a man who had no mu not much time for the Ahl Bayt. Now he is saved again by his aunt. And finally, Damascus. Um, and there are a number of, of events as well. So, so the head is sent to Damascus from Kufa. And Yazid expresses distress at seeing the condition of the head. So Ziyad has been poking the head with his stick and mocking it. Yazid is distressed by, by what he sees. And he's distressed when he sees how the prisoners have been treated. Now, we don't know if this is him desperately trying to make up for what he's done, or if it's a genuine horror, but he, he expresses in lament and in poetry, he basically says, Hussein, if I'd been with you, I'd never have allowed this to happen to you. He's attempting to, to gain favor once again. He reacts very angrily when the women and children are brought in because there's a man called Muhafid who, who announces at the door, I've brought you the head of the worst person who ever lived. And Yazid answers, you are the worst person who ever lived. Your mother gave birth to the worst person who ever lived. So he's angry that the head is being ill-treated, and he's angry that the women and the children are being ill-treated. The survivors are brought into his presence, and also the presence of these nobles, these Syrian nobles who Yazid has gathered around him. And he begins by addressing Ali. The, 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 the encounter between Ali and Yazid is more moving even than the encounter between Zainab. Because Ali, Ali, if I could talk in, in Christian terms for a moment, Ali at this moment is like Jesus on trial, who doesn't speak, he just stands there. And Pontius Pilate says, why don't you answer me? Don't you realize I've got power to kill you? Ali is almost a Jesus-like figure remaining in silence, and it's the silence that's going to permeate the whole of his life from that moment on. He's going to remain silent, but he is silent before Yazid, who keeps saying to him, Ma lak, la tatakalam, what's wrong with you that you don't speak to me? Twice or three times he says it, and then Ali answers him. So, so Yazid says to him, what is your name? And he says, Ali, and he says, no, you can't be Ali. God kill Ali. Bin al Hussein. <coughs> and this boy answers, I had a brother whose name was also Ali bin al Hussein, but the people killed him. And as he said, No, the people didn't kill him, God killed him. And then Ali begins to quote Quran at Yazid. And Yazid has his son standing next to him. And he says to his son, Answer him. And his son is unable to quote Quran. And Yazid, in embarrassment, then has to attempt to quote Quran back at Ali. But the quotations from Quran make Yazid think that Ali is a man, and he says, I think you're one of them. And he orders him to be stripped <coughs> naked. And he orders a physical examination to make sure that he's reached maturity. Now, it's quite clear at 23 years old that this boy is not a child. But this, I am convinced, is Yazid mocking the boy as Imam, and saying, you're not a real leader. I'm a real leader. You're just a boy. And he mocks him and then orders him to be killed. And once again, both Ali and Zainab appeal to him and say, well, if you've got any kinship between us, says Ali, at least you have to protect these women. You have to give them someone to look after them. There's also a very curious um, intervention that Yazid is distressed and criticizes Ziyad for the way he's treated these prisoners. And he calls him terrible names, again, very much like the name that the boy called his killer, he mocks Ibn Ziyad. And it seems to me that Yazid is attempting to backtrack and win some favor for himself because he's realizing now what he's done. And although his distance from the battlefield might in some way lessen his guilt, he is still guilty. And he cannot escape this historical guilt. There's the intervention of a Syrian. It's a very curious intervention because we don't know. Either he's a Syrian who's got red hair and blue eyes, Ahmad, or, 
or his name is Ahmar. So some of the texts say a Syrian called Ahmar, and others say a red-headed Syrian, stands up and sees uh, one of the daughters of Al Hussein, Fatima, um, and, and says, I want her as a slave girl. And Zainab intervenes and says, that's not your right. You have no right to this. And it's a moment when Fatima says, I grabbed my aunt's cloak and held on to her because she was bigger than me and wiser than me. And Zainab challenges the Syrian. And eventually Yazid says, stay a bachelor. Sit down and stay a bachelor. And the Syrian sits down. So it's a very curious dialogue. Then you have this um, Zainab-Yazid encounter which is much shorter than the encounter that she had with Ziyad. And Yazid is more interested in Ali, and he becomes fixated with this boy and won't eat a meal unless the boy is there. So for the few days that they are in Damascus, this boy takes on... Uh, there's a curious fixation that Yazid has with this boy who is now the imam, the fourth imam of Shia Islam. <coughs> and finally, it is Yazid who, who sends them who sends them back to Medina, and his last words to Ali are, anything you need, tell me, and I will give it to you. So the Yazid at the end of this encounter is massively chastened by Zainab's huge sermon that she preaches at him, this protest in which she just shreds his power, shreds his authority, shreds his dignity, and, and how she survives this if you read the speech, and again, I, I, I have it, but it's, it's easily available, you wonder how she survived, how anybody could have said this to the, the so-called caliph of Islam and get away with it, but she does. And finally, he releases the woman and the children and sends them back. And that's the moment that Zainab's role comes to an end. She steps back because now Zainal Abedin takes on his rightful role. There are, there's a particular moment when Zain says to her aunt, be quiet so that I can speak. And I think that marks not the moment of delegation as imam, that's happened long ago, but the moment when he actually starts to become imam and fulfill the role. And Zainab, having become Zainab, steps back into the shadows of history. She's played a magnificent role. She's been the leader of Shi Islam for a few days. She's held the Ahl Bayt together and she's perpetuated forever the memory of her brother. Now she steps back and about a year after Karbala, she dies. Where? Hard to know. Some people say Egypt. And the Egyptian theory has a lot of followers. Some people say that she dies in Damascus. Some people that, sh that she dies in Medina. It's very hard. I read one famous um, mystic, Sufi, Sunni Sufi, who insists that her tomb is in Egypt. And he says every day, I would stop at her tomb and make dua there and beg her to intercede for me. This, he said, this is Zainab, daughter of Ali, who lies buried in this tomb. But there is a big debate, <coughs> and it is hard to know. So I will stop there, because my voice is finished. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Kloosi for, a, uh, as usual, a very impassioned uh, lecture about the character and history of Hazrat uh, Zainab, Salamu Alaiha. Uh, we have a beautiful saying in Farsi, Ay khushaw ke hadith dil garan, kufta ayyad, dar hadith, Ay khushaw ke hadith dil garan, maybe I, Jahangi, can help me. Kufta ayyad, dar hadith dil garan. What we, what, we, what we have heard is uh, so beautiful because it is, uh, it is by someone uh, who was not raised like us. We are all geograph most of us are geographic Muslims. And uh, he has uh, come to this. Come in, please. Gemma Tully, she is the publisher. Please come and sit here. Yeah, she had to deal. She had to deal with some uh, train accident, and you know she has gone through so many hurdles to get here. Okay. Uh, I, now that I've seen Gemma, I would like to first of all thank you for coming here. She has brought some copies, and uh, those, those of you who are interested to purchase the book at a discount today, uh, you're welcome to buy it from her, and uh, Dr. Kolasi will sign it for you. 
the price for uh, Hazrat Zainab's book is 45 pounds, which is much less than what you can find on the internet or even from the actual for publisher. And uh, if you can't afford that, definitely buy the book about Hazrat Fatima, which is 25 pounds. And that's a great book, and uh, I'm sure some of the students have purchased it because we have at least one copy of that at the library. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. DeMartino to uh, take the podium and uh, uh, discuss the book. Would you like to come up? No, no, no. Okay, before you start, uh, I have to start. Uh, I think since we are recording, you should come here. Because everything is set up already. First of all, I'd like to thank Christopher for uh, producing such producing such a work, and of course, it's forced me to read it in, in a week, which means that uh, I didn't mind it at all. I mean, I it's taken me through to a journey, the same journey that is taken you today, and uh, for us, for, for the Shia, uh, this is a, a well-known journey. But of course, it's the interpretation that are given. Uh, obviously, we can can vary occasionally. For me, the value of the book primarily. Um, uh, stands in, in, in its the academic value, it's, it's the collection of uh, sources that you've produced. You both put Sunnis and Shia sources together, you have analyzed them, you presented those who are, in your opinion, are, are more uh, acceptable one, and, uh, and that is a, a, a worth, worth having in your library. I'm not getting a commission, by the way. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but and of course, you, in, in the presentation, you mostly focused on the story and, and sorts of things. And, but uh, you also spoke speak about the book about the reinterpretation of Zen. And I think this was the thing which was more interesting for me. Uh, not so much the, the, the old historical narratives, but rather the, this, uh, this attempt that you make to reinterpret or represent Zen, which uh, I wasn't sure if you thought that that I think that's been sort of stolen by the reinterpretation. Maybe it's something that you can, can clarify uh, later on. And uh, there are a few statements. For example, statement that uh, sort of kept my eyes and obviously me thinking. For example, you, you, you quote at uh, one point Dabashi about Shism being uh, loses his moral authority when it becomes power and so, so the best things about Shiism is so when it is other positions and things like that. So these are things that uh, need to be unpacked and, and, and further understood uh, obviously. Um, but overall I mean I thoroughly enjoyed I enjoyed it. I mean your work is uh, it's it, it's dense of course because it requires to be to have an academic rigor. Uh, but it's funny but your presentation doesn't actually uh, just to the book, in the sense that because you're, you're telling the story, whereas the book has got a reference, it's got uh, it's got the sources, it's got your your understanding and your explanation of where the references are coming from, and so uh, yes, I mean for for Shia Jones, that's perfect. In fact, maybe anybody who wants to invite him for the next Muharra, certainly could be a good uh, speaker for that. But um, the emotion is there. I think you 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 captured the essence of Shiism. You captured uh, uh, also the, the feeling of the community uh, when, when you remind the members this is this, uh, this, 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 uh, uh, Zenam. So um, there's another thing that obviously you dis you mentioned is about the authenticity and uh, unauthenticity, inauthenticity of, of Zenam, which uh, of the way we read Zenam. This is also uh, like you to perhaps to explain a little bit more what you mean by uh, authenticity. Uh, you, dis you, discuss, you discuss about the three characters uh, that can be identified in the old narratives, the, the middle narratives, and then the modern na narratives. And those ones possibly, I think, could be of great interest to our, to our audience because there is a transformation here. Uh, I don't know if you mentioned at the beginning that it, uh, that it was necessary perhaps to reevaluate the traditional view because perhaps gives a more humane and more uh, uh, 
uh, for you was more real uh, sort of uh, idea of, of, the, of this lady. Um, even that, that one obviously uh, we can discuss because I felt personally that uh, yes, you're absolutely right, the narrative changes, uh, but there is also uh, it's part of an evolution, and, and, and the evolution is within the community as well. I, I saw you in your book, in your references, you, you mentioned uh, Hegland, uh, Mary Hegland, uh, and she has an interesting study on uh, the commemoration of Ashura in Iran prior and after the revolution, and how the character of Hussein as intercessor and as a heroic figure sort of changes. Uh, but she considered it as uh, a phase of the same coin, basically. Uh, and I think possibly with Zena would be the same thing. And to, uh, I, I think you rightly say that this is not to detract from the other, but it seems that you, you are more um, favor, your favor is more about discovering this, this human aspect of, uh, of Zena, which uh, I, I think so. But, Anybody in the community who comes, someone like me, for example, who comes from a, from a political background, automatically I would, I would have associated them with this heroic, heroic figure. But I know that equally within the Shia community, uh, a more classical, you know, the, more, the older generation perhaps, automatically has that, that other vision of their other sufferers, someone who suffered for the same, same Islam and so forth and so on. And so, uh, uh, I, it's not that I'm uncomfortable, but certainly I think it's part of a, of, of a package. And it has to be like it's an evolution. And, and to say that this one is not part of her, or, or the other one, you know, the heroic vision is, is a transformation that seems almost uh, pushed upon her, sort of forced upon her, uh, perhaps doesn't, doesn't tell the, 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 the full stories. Um, what else have I picked up? Okay, so, uh, we can go back on, on as I said, the three uh, images that you that you mentioned of Zena. That, that would be, uh, and uh, so in, the, in the space of time I had to go through the things, I thoroughly enjoyed it again, uh, and I'd like to give you further explore, uh, explain some of this point before we, we can ask uh, our audience to put more questions. Right? Okay. okay. So there was, um, there was a tendency um, at the time leading up to and during the Iranian revolution when they began to use the word authentic and inauthentic yeah. in, terms of, in terms of the telling of the whole story of Karbala and Ashura, not just Zainab, who is a part of that story, but of the wider reading. And there was a, a tendency uh, to, for some theologians to say that the older reading, that is, a great deal of weeping, of inflicting pain on oneself, um, the idea of atonement, that, that, but especially the kind of the weeping, that that was not an authentic reading of what Karbala was, and that Karbala was, the authentic reading of Karbala was this huge stand for justice against injustice, this immense moment of courage on the part of the members of Hussein's party who stood against injustice, and that it therefore continues as a paradigm for all of history as, as, as how humans should live and how humans should face injustice. Now, my reading, there was a sense that the old version, the, you know, what they called the inauthentic version, was, was, there was an attempt to push it out and say, this is not a good way to understand Karbala and, and, and Zainab within Karbala. And my thought was an attempt to find the middle path so, 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 so that, that both readings are important, but that there'd been this tendency to move away from the, the suffering of Zainab, the weakness of Zainab. Now, I understand from a theological point of view, her position not as Masuma, but with a, certainly a secondary Isma. I understand this, that she is a, a crucial member of the Ahl Bayt. But I don't think that in any way detracts from her femininity, her womanhood, her motherhood, and her ability to suffer and to be fearful and to be anxious. Now, for, I was attempted to pull the two together and say, the transformation is that she is both, that she goes through great fear in the, the days leading up to Karbala and great suffering, 
And then there's this transformation when she realizes that she has to take on the powers that be, both on the battlefield and after the, after the battle. But that even then, for example, during her, her dialogue with Ziad, she breaks down in tears when he mocks her. He, that's what he does. There, there's a, there's a, a breakdown so that you have this woman who is frightened and has lost everything, and yet she pulls her resources together at the moment that she has to. And my thought that was, there's the danger of losing that weakness, element of weakness. So, so one of the reasons why I identify with Shia more than I do with Sunni in my own scholarship is this idea of weakness, is this idea of being constantly persecuted, the minority that is always unjustly treated, that's not given its authentic status or power, and that that's the whole history, and that somehow that's where the strength of Shia Islam lies, as one author said. And I don't necessarily agree with everything he says, but certainly that point was interesting for me because it resonates in terms of Christianity today as a, as a minority that's being hammered from all sides and, and has to somehow survive all of that. That, that. that the loss of earthly power is not necessarily a loss of power. And that within Shia Islam, you have this idea that, that the real power lies in, in, on the spiritual side, on the religious side, on the side of being faithful to everything that the Prophet stood for, rather than having a dynasty or being in charge, that that's where power lies, and that, that somehow we have to tap into that. And that therefore, the fearful, weak, frightened Zainab is an important part of the story, as is the heroic woman who, who challenges both the governor and the caliph and survives both encounters in some way. So it was an attempt to do that. Um, I, you know, I, I favor in some sense the weaker, um, but that's because my experience of women today is that they suffer terribly and that things are inflicted upon them and that Zainab could be a model that even, even in her fear and her her being oppressed, she was able to, to, to stand up when she had to. But I, I, I agree that both models are important, that during the time of the revolution, and this is not an area I know well, but certainly people needed the image of an heroic woman who went out and stood up for what was just at great cost, having perhaps lost her husband and her sons, now she was out on the battlements fighting for what was right, and that's a very important model, but without losing the other one. So. I've also insisted that this is a first reading because, because there must be scholars now who will continue to read the life of Zainab and dig out the riches and, and begin to produce the phases of her life that are so important, the, the pre kabbalah and the post kabbalah phases of her life. Um, so, so that's what I've attempted to do. And I understand that it's a very dangerous path because I know that, you know, now the same argument that I mentioned in the book, the same argument occurred about Fatima. There were some theologians who were saying, you've got to cut out all of this mystical stuff, all of this voices speaking to her from heaven, the angels speaking to her, all of these visions, because that's not the Fatima we need. What we need is a, a human model, or a model for humanity of standing for what is right, preaching her famous khutbah afterwards, fighting against the injustices. And there were other theologians who were saying, if you take away the mystical part, Shia Islam is going to lose a great richness that you have to find a way of combining them both. And that's, for me, the secret of the Akhil Bayt, is that at one and the same time, they fulfill a double role. That is, the role of leadership and the role of a more mystical um, passing on of, of knowledge, and you have to have both. Okay, well, now we're going to open the floor to uh, Q&A, and uh, you can take a seat and relax, because you're more too standing. Uh, those who have Questions, please ask only one question per uh, questioner, and then we can open the uh, floor to further question by you if there are no more questions. Um, you can use this, but don't get, bring it too close. It starts uh, screaming. So please, uh, pres uh, before you ask your question, introduce yourself, uh, even though other people know you, and uh, ask one question, please. It can be even a comment. I know uh, Dr. Amina in Laws is here and she has read the book and I'm sure she has, uh, you know, her comments about the book. Oh, well, thank you for the presentation. 
presentation. It was very clear, not too much and not too little. Uh, and I thought there were some uh, interesting new angles on it. Um, well, I just have a small question because I think you uh, explained it very well. Um, you alluded to some mystical meanings of the sun and the moon in the Kargola narrative or maybe other contemporaneous uh, writing. What do you think those mystical meanings are? Well, I, um, I picked up reading Tabori and reading other authors that the idea of the rising sun or a face like the sun or a face like the moon came up quite often in the texts. And, and so I, I immediately presumed that this, this has some deeper meaning. This is not just an adjective to describe somebody who was glowing. There's something deeper. So then I went to the Sunni texts and discovered, and in fact, I put a footnote in, how many times the prophet is, is referred to as having a face like the moon. Even Fatima describes her, her father's face like the moon. And so, so I didn't go much further than that. But if I were to answer, I would say that both the idea of the rising sun and the brightness of the moon quite clearly have a, a motif of a certain radiance that outshines all others, that the radiance of the sun outshines all the other stars and planets, that it stands above them, as does the radiance of the moon at night. And that, that so it suggests to me a particular status. Um, but I'd be interested to hear, because I'm sure there's a great deal more. Uh, and I certainly know that it's a theme that continues in the text, the idea of sun and moon. It's the idea that appears in other Shia texts, for instance, yeah. the famous yeah. Hadith of Kasa. Yeah. The, the, you know, Fatima says, I saw my father. Yeah. And he had the face like a face of, yeah. yes. So, so I, I'm quite interested because it's not, the mysticism is not an area I know well, but it quite clearly has something. In, and I was, interested, I was interested that the Sunni authors also, I mean, they're following Tabari, who says that she emerged from her tent and she looked like the sun rising. That's an extraordinary image. Mm. The sun rising has a certain power and force behind it and, and a brightness behind it. And it's not a usual way of describing the way somebody emerges onto, onto the scene. Especially in the middle of the desert. In the middle of the desert and in the middle of a battlefield. Uh, you know, she comes out into great danger. Why would you call her the sun rising? Now, I've heard commentators say, oh, well, because um, it has to do with the fact that she was unveiled or, or that she was not allowed, couldn't wear a veil, they were stripped of their veils. And I think that's a bit banal. I think it has a much deeper meaning than that. So I'd be interested to, I mean, I, it's not a subject I know well, I'd be interested to hear some ideas. Um, I that some fun. Yeah. I certainly put a footnote in and gave some references to other, and then this little boy, of course, and the little boy you know, is, is not expected to be fearless. He's a tiny little boy who can barely hold a sword. And yet he comes out of the battle and his face looks like the first splinter of the moon. So he's not quite on the same level as the prophet or even Zainab, but he has some radiance about him. I interpreted it as a transformation, some sort of transformation that gave a moment of immense courage either to Zainab to come out into the middle of a battle, not onto the outskirts, but the very place that her nephew was lying, and then this little boy. I mean, what little boy goes out into a battlefield? You know, in the, in the, he may want to play it soldiering, but in a heart of a battle, what little boy would want to do that? There must have been something there. And so, yeah, it's an interesting underlying theme. Any questions? And, oh, sorry, one more thing. There are texts, sort of, certainly, that talk about those in paradise who have faces that look like the sun. So there are a whole lot of texts about people of paradise also who, who are radiant. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the gentleman section. One, gents, ladies, please. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very good, very informative, very clear, and inspiring as well. Uh, so basically, two. Can I have two? Please questions? go ahead. Yeah, so two questions. Um, I'm taking the advantage of being the principal. Principal is <laughs> prerogative. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, in your studies and research, have you come across the reasons why? Lady Zainab's husband was not with him in the story of Karabala. And this is it's one of the divisions. <laughs> he stole your question. He <laughs> stole your question. It's a uh, between the historian. If, if she has two children or four. Yeah. So ha have you noticed it through, yeah. through your journey? I have, I have, I have. So, so, this is, yeah, so that's the first question. question. And the second is that. So for the general audience, I mean for non-Muslims and non-Shi'is, what 
points of her life did you find the kind of inspiring, interesting, and what points in her life did you find which I could call them in need of more explanation, maybe slightly ambiguous or slightly, I don't know, not fitting to to, to the mentality of maybe today's people. So, okay. So the first question is very interesting. When I wrote about Lady Fatima, one of my reasons was I was taking on and challenging a French priest called Henri Lamens. Now, Henri Lamens hated the Ahlbeit. I don't know what it was. He's long dead. He died years, years and years and years ago. He was a, a good Islamic scholar, but he was, a, he was in favor of Sunni Islam. And he had little time for the Ahl Bayt, and he wrote some terrible things about Lady Fatima. Basically, he said, Lady Fatima was a nuisance. Her father got so irritated with her that he married her off to Ali just to get rid of her. It was that sort of mentality. So I was taking on Father Henri Lamens to say his interpretation is wrong. He has not read the text. And in fact, there were a number of incidents where I thought he read the Arabic incorrectly. Lo and behold, I come across Ari Lamens again, writing about Zainab, reminding us that she divorced her husband. I've never heard this, that she divorced her husband so that she could go to Cairo. Well, first of all, so, so, so he was interpreting an Arabic word, and I don't remember the word, but it's in the book, which simply says she left the family home. And it's a word that you would use of a girl who, when she gets married, leaves the family home. It can mean divorce, but this is not the primary meaning. And I think Henri Lamans misread the Arabic because I could find no evidence that, that Zainab had divorced her husband because he had disagreed with her going to Karbala. Okay, so now, so that we push aside. There are a number of texts that suggest he wasn't happy about her going to Karbala. That he didn't agree with, with Hussein, not because from a political point of view, but because he thought, you're going to die. You're not going to succeed. Therefore, this is a pointless exercise. So the impression that is given in some of the texts is that he tried to dissuade Al-Hussein from going to Karbala. And when, when Hussein went to Karbala, his sister resolutely went with him, and that two of the maybe four sons, and I have a big question mark, Two of the sons stayed at home. Two of the sons, Aun and Muhammad, went with their mother, or maybe their stepmother, I'm not, not sure, to Karbala, where they both died. So, so, so you have a number of texts that mention her husband staying at home. Some of the texts say he was ill. He was unable to travel to Karbala because of illness. And that, that is why he sent two of his sons with. So, so there are at least two if not three possibilities to choose from that I came across. And I, I, the majority of texts suggested that he certainly did have doubts about whether this was going to work, as did many of the members of, because we know that there were a number of people who abandoned Hussein on the way, mm. kind of, as they began to realize. Uh, and there are other texts that suggest physically he couldn't make it. I don't know how many sons Zainab had. Because it is, it is a point of curiosity that, first of all, two sons come to Karbala with her, Aum and Muhammad. Mm. Now, if you read the, uh, uh, the Sunni texts like Ibn Asakir and Ibn Afir, they give lists of those who died at Karbala. Mm. And almost always they mention the mother of the martyr, except for Aum and Muhammad. They give different names, not Zainab. We have the shrine in the... The, the, after you finish Baghdad, you just enter Karbala. On the edge of Karbala, there is a shrine called Aun. But some people, they say it is Aun ibn al-Hasan, the son of yeah. Hassan. Son of the, the, uh, some of them, they say. There was more uh, than one Aun who died at Karbala. Yeah. But my worry is that, that, that the other martyrs have their mothers named by Sunni authors why are Zainab's sons not named as daughters of Zainab? So, so there's a possibility that her husband, although I think this is not possible because he was a young man when he married her, there's a possibility that he had other children. Maybe these were stepchildren. 
it is a it is a puzzle, and I put in an I put in an appendix. Say, eh? if anyone can help me, how many children they never had? It seems there were four. There were certainly two at home and two at Karbala, mm. but it is difficult to establish names and exact relationship. Uh, the second part of your question, um, I I was greatly inspired by a whole lot of things. Um, really, I called the book Half of My Heart because really it took a great deal of emotion to write the book. And I think my fellow priests were starting to get a little annoyed with me because every conversation was about what Zainab had said, what Zainab had done. So there's plenty, um, as there is in the life of Lady Fatima. But it's these two pivotal moments where she stands up against exceptionally powerful men. These are not just bad men, they are also powerful men. They wield influence. And, and I, I made the point in the book that, in the end, that that Zainab didn't cause Ziyad to back down, because he had to back down, he was going to kill her, he backed down, and Yazid had to back down and send them back to Medina. That she didn't get them to back down because she was braver than they were, or she, because she was speaking the truth, and they weren't. Mm -hmm. And the truth is an exceptionally powerful weapon. It doesn't always seem to be victorious, but truth always is victorious in the end. And the fact that she was speaking the truth to two men who were quite patently not telling the truth, that is the source of, and, and I have a, a thing about truth, you know. We depend, you and I, on, on truth. The nerves of my hand, when I put my hand on a hot stove, they send a message to my brain immediately to say, don't touch the stove, it's hot. If, if the nerves of our hands start lying to us, we will die. So we depend on truth to exist. Communities, whether it be the masjid or the church, depend on truth to survive. Let the truth be told always. And for me, in the end, Zainab is a model of truth. Living truthfully, mm -hmm. thinking truthfully, and telling the truth. And for me, that is the most inspiring thing. So now I'm working on the life of Al-Abbas, who is the bravest oh, man yeah. who ever lived. So, 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 but it's a different type of bravery. Al-Abbas trying to carry water to the young children, especially to little Fatima, this is a different type of heroism from the heroism of, of Zainab. It's a different type of truth telling. And that's why he interests me. But I think that, that for me, is, is where her. And that's where she's a model for not just Muslims or Shia or women. Hussein and, and Zainab are models that transcend religious boundaries and gender boundaries. They're just models of truth and courage. And people need that. Thank you. Um, please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Rabia Malik. I work as a psychotherapist, and I'm really interested in the stories from within the Islamic tradition and their therapeutic relevance. So um, the comment I just wanted to make was that for me, actually, it's really powerful that you talk about the two aspects to her, the grief and the heroic element, because I think what, for me, is remarkable about her is that having witnessed such losses and such grief that she then rises and is able to kind of speak this truth to power that you talk about. Um, and I'm also interested in, I mean, you've kind of answered it, but if there's anything more you could add to it about what it was that personally drew you to her. Well, I'd written on Lady Fatima uh, for my doctoral thesis because, again, um, I thought nobody's written about her. I don't understand how there can be such devotion to the prophet's only surviving daughter, and I can't find a single book. I found one book in German, but the authoress, who was a good scholar, I don't think she had Arabic, because she didn't refer to any Arabic text. Oh, well, that's not, that's. Um, so I, I wrote on Fatima, I was going to write on Al Hussein, uh, a sort of a Christology of Al Hussein. And I wrote on, on, and of course, and then I'll tell you the truth, four Catholic priests, because we, we all work together, sitting around a table in Rome, basically complaining about the Muslim scholars, and saying, why don't they write about the women? Why is it always the men? <laughs> From Ibn Sa'ad onward, all the women are relegated to the last volume, and they're extraordinary women. In fact, I discovered that Ibn Asakir, who writes this history of Damascus, Ibn Asakir has all of his women in his last volume except for eight women, who are in his second volume in the life of Muhammad. He's put in eight women who had a special relationship. And nobody realizes that these women are not in the last volume. They're right there in volume two of Ibn so, so, so we all agreed, these four priests, we all said, okay, we're each going to take an Islamic woman and we're going to write a biography. I'm the only one who actually did it, none of the others did it. <laughs> I actually took it seriously, went straight to my study and started to read Zainab. 
Um, and, and the more I read, the more inspired I was, because I, she is an extraordinary woman. I mean, you know, Fatima is different from Zainab. I know that they say Zainab reflects. No, Fatima is different. There's something about Zainab that is just extraordinary. And maybe it's because we live in the same world as she did, a very violent world, where people are abused easily. And, and where every day there are women who are mothers and wives who are just heroic in tiny ways. Even the fact that you and I every day have to make moral decisions that we don't want to make, because mm -hmm. they're going to make us unpopular. It's that sort of thing. So she's an extraordinary woman. And I hope that mine is just a first reading, that there are lots of other readings to follow. Thank you so much. We have to wrap it up. Uh, if anyone has any question, maybe we can take one more question. Or one more comment from the discussion. Well, one comment. I would just back to book. You, you gave four aims for your writing this, this book. The fourth one is to do with, well, you say theological appreciation, present a theological appreciation of Zainab by a non Muslim with a comparison between her and Mary in the Catholic book. But then you you go further and say, actually, the best, best comparison is not with Mary. Jesus, but rather with Mary Magdalene. Yeah. Can you just explain? Because in Christian theology, um, Mary Magdalene, in Christian theology, is the first witness to the resurrection. Mm -hmm. So all the disciples ran away. They all were frightened. And Mary Magdalene went to the tomb on Easter Sunday morning, and there she witnessed the resurrection, or she witnessed the Lord. She was the first preacher of Christian faith. It was Mary Magdalene. She was the first one who went back to the men and said, I've seen him. He is alive. Therefore, for those few weeks, or not weeks, those few minutes or hours, she was the primary carrier of a truth. And in that sense, Zainab, now, now I got into big trouble because I said, well, was Zainab like an imam? Because I didn't write that. I just asked that to Shia scholars here last year, and I got into big trouble. But I said, you know, in a sense, for a few days, between Karbala and and getting, and the moment that Zain al Abidin took on his role, there was no active Imam. It was almost like the hidden Imam, or, or if you like, it was almost as though she played the role of the sort of ambassador, the, the, the Nai. Interim, interim Imam. Yeah, uh, that spoke on behalf of the Imam. And those four or eight of them at the end, before the, 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 the occultation, they played a significant role. And maybe that she was the model of that, but that she she was the real leader for a few days. She held the Alba together. Um, so I said, does, could God, without giving her the authority of the Imam and and the 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 the, the knowledge of the Imam, could he give her some of the characteristics of the Imama for a few days? I think God can do it. And this was a question I was asking. So 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 Ali Shomari said. Go, go. That's, that's too controversial. <laughs> so I got pushed aside. But it, it is interesting for me that, that I understand the imamate and I understand how it works. But but could God give some of the characteristics of imama to a particular person in a situation? Well, on that comment, <laughs> oh, we're going to end it. You can turn that down. Uh, and, uh, I would like to quote the late Ali Shariati, who was killed in this city, perhaps killed or died, God knows what happened to him, uh, 40 years ago almost, uh, more than 40, 41 years ago, when he said that uh, uh, at the end of his uh, lecture on martyrdom, he said, those who have died, they did some, something Husseini. Those who have stayed have to do something Zainabi. <laughs> Otherwise, they're all Yazidi. <laughs> <laughs> so that issue that you raise about Hazrat Zainab being the messenger, being the messenger of truth, is the last statement that Ali Shariti Rahmatullah made in his famous martyrdom speech, after which all of his lectures were banned and he was placed in in jail. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to invite you to stay and purchase the books from Gemma, who has made this specific trip all the way from Cambridge to here. 
uh, having a stayed at a uh, train station for hours for the train to uh, trains to resume their travels to London. Uh, please take advantage and purchase the copies. Uh, and Dr. Closey will will uh, will sign the book for you. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Well, sure. Water. Tea. Tea or tea or water. I <laughs> 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 Okay, thank you. So the Fatima is 25, which is 40% discount, and so um, did you did you ask Georgius to publish you in paperback when? I wish I had. Um, well, I, I saw won't. it for the first time they, the other day and it's hard back. They won't, they won't, they'll do it later can. on. It's nice oh, to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you bought your book. Yeah, yeah, I right. Thank you so much. Right. Yeah. But, but eventually yeah. we'll decide what Fatima had done in paperback yeah. and it's beautiful. It and eventually, is. eventually yeah. Zainab will be in paperback. Uh, to the cover art on, on all of these is really beautiful. Um, I, I was really impressed how it came out. Yeah, we out. only recently started putting images on the covers yeah. so before it was just patterns. Yeah. So, uh, I, I think it's an excellent it's idea. It adds a lot of great So my sister chose true. the picture for Fatima oh, when we were in South Africa and I chose the picture for it. And I had to write to Karbala TV in Karbala yeah. in Arabic, a little email saying, May I have permission? Yeah. To <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and he said, Yes, you can publish this book. Um, I also have information about our Islamic History and Thought series, if people are interested. So. They can't get published with us. Hmm? Yeah, they have get published with us. Yours is different. Actually, I was today, and I got the one by Rodin, which is, a, which is a, re it's a republication of an older book. Uh, women in, in Islam. Yeah, I used to use that in my classroom. It's a recap, it's a recap. Yeah, yeah, I think we got down to the high. Is it the high? Okay, it's literally two. Is it 25 each? Uh, 25 for the paperback and it's 45 for the hardback because we only have the hardback. Thank you, people. expensive. As I'm she afraid she is until we can make her paperback. But I don't know if you discuss with Melanie that maybe we can do it in the future. I don't know. Well, yes. I have to present it now. I've got two books on the on the burner, <laughs> but I, they won't be finished for a while. Of you know. I'll be back in a minute. Yeah, I'll be back. So how's your trip been? Oh, it's been very busy, to be honest. Yeah. 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 I don't get any money. I wish I did get the progress. Places to live and other departments. Thanks for asking, though. Oh, it's alright that many greater people before tell me them they have are to buy them. terrible. There's some books you have to have. Yeah, Just tell yeah. them that and see. And see if you can convince them. <laughs> yeah. Is it 45? Yes, yes. 45. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Sorry. It's have you had it signed? Do you want to sign? Yeah, we'd just like it signed for the yeah. entire department if possible. We should get one if you don't have one. We don't have oh. a library. We should just get one for like your yes. house. We can just take it for the traditional house at the top. Sound about 
400 the other day. Wow. <laughs> Straight to lunch. <laughs> it was really exhausting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, very interesting. Sorry. I don't know if you want to take some flyers for the department just about the series because there are all kinds sure. of throw, throw, them, throw them around. Mm -hmm. we'll take some of these. And when well. are you hoping to um, complete the? Well, the I've got, you know what the trouble is. I've been being greedy now because I've already started something else on the the, the dreams of Um Salam and Um Al Fadl about Karbala. And I was going to put a companion together of all of these dreams that the Prophet had, Fatima had, Salama, Fadl, Um Ayman. There were a whole string of these dreams, the uh, Qarura, the, 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 the hadith of the glass vial. And so I started on that. Then on the day of his birth, yeah. I got all inspired about Al Abbas and you know, yeah. nobody's written a biography of this now. So yeah. I've begun to do some research on him and try and make some. And it will be like fact that there's in that book. It will be reading, the first reading yeah. in his life, yeah. trying to establish a few facts about him. So yeah. it will be a while. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. 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 Send them to your inbox. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Thank you so, so much for this work. It just amazes me in America. It will, it will. And I'm so glad that we have a printer in Easting Away, so we're able to print some books in the UK. It's going to change. Now we've got people writing finally. This is good. They're called the. Yeah. So she should be I'll be back now. Yep, no